Chapter 7, Part 2 of The Rainbow Trail by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sago Lilies, Part 2. Next morning Joe Lake returned and imparted news that was perturbing to Shefford. Reports of Shad had come in to Stonebridge from different Indian villages. Joe was not inclined to linger long at the camp and favored taking the trail with the pack train. Shefford discovered that he did not want to leave the valley, and the knowledge made him reflective. That morning he did not go into the village and stayed in camp alone. A depression weighed upon him. It was dispelled, however, early in the afternoon by the sight of a slender figure in white swiftly coming down the path to the spring. He had an appointment with Mary to go see the sago lilies. Everything else slipped his mind. Mary wore the long black hood that effectually concealed her face. It made of her a woman, a Mormon woman, and strangely belied the lithe form and the braid of gold hair. Good day, she said, putting down her bucket. Do you still want to go to see the lilies? Yes, replied Shefford with a short laugh. Can you climb? I'll go where you go. Then she set off under the cedars, and Shefford stalked at her side. He was aware that Neste Bega watched them walk away. This day, so far at least, Shefford did not feel talkative, and Mary had always been one who mostly listened. They came at length to a place where the wall rose in low, smooth swells, not steep, but certainly at an angle, Shefford would not of his own accord have attempted to scale. Light, quick, and sure as a mountain sheep, Mary went up the first swell to an offset above. Shefford, in amaze and admiration, watched the little moccasins as they flashed and held on to the smooth rock. When he essayed to follow her, he slipped and came to grief. A second attempt resulted in like failure. Then he backed away from the wall, to run forward fast and up the slope, only to slip halfway up and fall again. He made light of the incident, but she was solicitous. When he assured her he was unhurt, she said he had agreed to go where she went. But I'm not a bird, he protested. Take off your boots, then you can climb. When we get over the wall, it'll be easy, she said. In his stocking feet he had no great difficulty walking up the first bulge of the walls, and from there she led him up the strange waves of wind-worn rock. He could not attend to anything save the red, polished rock under him, and so saw little. The ascent was longer than he would have imagined, and steep enough to make him pant. But at last a huge round summit was reached. From here he saw down into the valley where the village lay, but for the lazy columns of blue smoke curling up from the pinions, the place would have seemed uninhabited. The wall on the other side was about level with the one upon which he stood. Beyond rose other walls and cliffs, up and up, to the great towering peaks between which the green and black mountain loomed. Facing the other way, Shefford had only a restricted view. There were low crags and smooth stone ridges, between which were aisles green with cedar and pinion. Shefford's companion headed toward one of these, and when he had followed her a few steps, he could no longer see down into the valley. The Mormon village where she lived was as if it were lost, and when it vanished, Shefford felt a difference. Scarcely had the thought passed when Mary removed the dark hood. Her small head glistened like gold in the sunlight. Shefford caught up with her and walked at her side, but could not bring himself at once deliberately to look at her. They entered a narrow, low-walled lane, where cedars and pinions grew thickly, their fragrance heavy in the warm air, and flowers began to show in the grassy patches. "'This is Indian paintbrush,' she said, pointing to little, low, scarlet flowers. A gray sage-bush with beautiful purple blossoms she called purple sage. Another bush with yellow flowers she named buckbrush. And there were vermilion cacti and low flat mounds 
of lavender daisies, which she said had no name. A whole mossy bank was covered with lace-like green leaves, and tiny blossoms the color of violets, which she called loco. Loco? Is this what makes horses go crazy when they eat it? he asked. It is indeed, she said, laughing. When she laughed, it was impossible not to look at her. She walked a little in advance. Her white cheek and temple seemed framed in the gold of her hair. How white her skin! But it was like pearl, faintly veined and flushed. The profile, clear-cut and pure, appeared cold, almost stern. He knew now that she was singularly beautiful, though he had yet to see her full face. They walked on. Quite suddenly, the lane opened out between two rounded bluffs and Shefford looked down upon a grander and more awe-inspiring scene than ever he had viewed in his dreams. What appeared to be a green mountainside sloped endlessly down to a plain, and that rolled and billowed away to a boundless region of strangely carved rock. The greatness of the scene could not be grasped in a glance. The slope was long, the plain not as level as it seemed to be on first sight. Here and there, round red rocks, isolated and strange, like lonely castles, rose out of the green. Beyond the green, all the earth seemed naked, showing smooth, glistening bones. It was a formidable wall of rock that flung itself up in the distance, carved into a thousand canyon and walls and domes and peaks, and there was not a straight, nor a broken, nor a jagged line in all that wildness. The color low down was red, dark blue, and purple in the clefts, yellow upon the heights, and in the distance rainbow-hued, a land of curves and color. Shefford uttered an exclamation. "'That's Utah,' said Mary. "'I come often to sit here. You see that winding blue line there? That's San Juan Canyon, and the other dark line? That's Escalante Canyon.' they wind down into this great purple chasm, way over here to the left, and that's the Grand Canyon. They say not even the Indians have been in there. Shefford had nothing to say. The moment was one of subtle and vital assimilation. Such places as this to be unknown to men. What strength, what wonder, what help, what glory, just to sit there an hour, slowly and appallingly to realize. Something came to Shefford from the distance, out of the purple canyon, and from those dim, wind-worn peaks. He resolved to come here to this promontory again and again, alone and in humble spirit, and learn to know why he had been silenced, why peace pervaded his soul. It was with this emotion upon him that he turned to find his companion watching him. Then, for the first time, he saw her face fully and was thrilled that chance had reserved the privilege for this moment. It was a girl's face, he saw, flower-like, lovely, and pure as a Madonna's, and strangely, tragically sad. The eyes were large, dark gray, the color of the sage. They were as clear as the air, which made distant things close, and yet they seemed full of shadows, like a ruffled pool under midnight stars. They disturbed him, her mouth had the sweet curves and redness of youth, but it showed bitterness, pain, and repression. "'Where are the sago lilies?' he asked suddenly. "'Farther down. It's too cold up here for them. Come,' she said. He followed her down a winding trail, down and down, till the green plain rose to blot out the scrawled wall of rock, down into a verdant canyon, where a brook made swift music over stones where the air was sultry and hot, laden with the fragrant breath of flower and leaf. This was a canyon of summer, and it bloomed. The girl bent and plucked something from the grass. Here's a white lily, she said. There are three colors. The yellow and pink ones are deeper down in the canyon. Shefford took the flower and regarded it with great interest. He had never seen such an exquisite thing. It had three large petals, curving cup-like, of a whiteness purer than new-fallen snow, and a heart of rich warm gold. Its fragrance was so faint as to be almost indistinguishable, 
yet of a haunting, unforgettable sweetness. And even while he looked at it, the petals drooped, and their whiteness shaded, and the gold paled. In a moment the flower was wilted. "'I don't like to pluck the lilies,' said Mary. "'They die so swiftly.' Shefford saw the white flowers everywhere in the open, sunny places along the brook. They swayed with stately grace in the slow, warm wind. They seemed like three-pointed stars shining out of the green. He bent over one with a particularly lofty stem, and after a close survey of it, he rose to look at her face. His action was plainly one of comparison. She laughed and said it was foolish for the women to call her the Sago Lily. She had no coquetry. She spoke as she would have spoken of the stones at her feet. She did not know that she was beautiful. Shefford imagined there was some resemblance in her to the lily, the same whiteness, the same rich gold, and more striking than either, a strange, rare quality of beauty, of life, intangible as something fleeting, the spirit that had swiftly faded from the plucked flower. Where had the girl been born? What had her life been? Shefford was intensely curious about her. She seemed as different from any other woman he had known, as this rare canyon lily was different from the tame flowers at home. On the return up the slope she outstripped him. She climbed lightly and tirelessly. When he reached her upon the promontory, there was a stain of red in her cheeks, and her expression had changed. Let's go back up over the rock, she said. I've not climbed for, for so long. I'll go where you go, he replied. Then she was off, and he followed. She took to the curves of the bare rocks and climbed. He sensed a spirit released in her. It was so strange, so keen, so wonderful to be with her. And when he did catch her, he feared to speak, lest he break his mood. Her eyes grew dark and daring, and often she stopped to look away across the wavy sea of stones to something beyond the great walls. When they got high, the wind blew her hair loose, and it flew out a golden stream with the sun bright upon it. He saw that she changed her direction, which had been in line with the two peaks, and now she climbed toward the heights. They came to a more difficult ascent, where the stone still held to the smooth curves. Yet was marked by steep bulges and slants and crevices. Here she became a wild thing. She ran, she leaped. She would have left him far behind had he not called. Then she appeared to remember him and waited. Her face had now lost its whiteness. It was flushed, rosy, warm. Where did you ever learn to run over rocks this way? He panted. All my life I've climbed, she said. Ah, it's good to be up on the walls again to feel the wind, to see. Thereafter, he kept close to her, no matter what the effort. He would not miss a moment of her, if he could help it. She was wonderful. He imagined she must be like an Indian girl, or a savage who loved the lofty places and the silence. When she leaped, she uttered a strange, low, sweet cry of wildness and exultation. Shefford guessed she was a girl freed from her prison, forgetting herself, living again youthful hours. She did not forget him. She waited for him at the bad places, lent him a strong hand, and sometimes let it stay long in his clasp. Tireless and agile, sure-footed as a goat, fleet and wild, she leaped and climbed and ran until Shefford marveled at her. This adventure was indeed fulfillment of a dream. Perhaps she might lead him to the treasure at the foot of the rainbow. But that thought, sad with memory, daring forth from its grave, was irrevocably linked with a girl who was dead. He could not remember her in the presence of this wonderful creature, who was as strange as she was beautiful. When Shefford reached for the brown hand stretched forth to help him in a leap, when he felt its strong clasp, the youth and vitality and life of it, he had the fear of a man who was running toward a precipice and who could not draw back. This was a climb, a lark, a wild race to the Mormon girl, bound now in the village, and by the very freedom of it she betrayed her bonds. To Shefford it was also a wild race, 
but toward one sure goal he dared not name. They went on, and at length, hand in hand, even where no steep step or wide fissure gave reason for the class. But she seemed unconscious. They were nearing the last height, a bare eminence, when she broke from him and ran up the smooth stone. When he surmounted it, she was standing on the very summit, her arms wide, her full breast heaving, her slender body straight as an Indian's, her hair flying in the wind and blazing in the sun. She seemed to embrace the West, to reach for something afar, to offer herself to the wind and distance. Her face was scarlet from the exertion of the climb. Her broad brow was moist. Her eyes had the piercing light of an eagle's, though now they were dark. Shefford instinctively grasped the essence of this strange spirit, primitive and wild. She was not the woman who had met him at the spring. She had dropped some side of her with that Mormon hood, and now she stood totally strange. She belonged up here, he divined. She was part of that wildness. She must have been born and brought up in loneliness, where the wind blew and the peaks loomed and silence held dominion. The sinking sun touched the rim of the distant wall, and as if in parting regret shone with renewed golden fire, and the girl was crowned as with a glory. Shefford loved her then, realizing it. He thought he might have loved her before, but that did not matter when he was certain of it now. He trembled a little, fearfully, though without regret. Everything pertaining to his desert experience had been strange. This was the strangest of all. The sun sank swiftly, and instantly there was a change in the golden light. Quickly it died out. The girl changed as swiftly. She seemed to remember herself, and sat down as if suddenly weary. Shefford went closer and seated himself beside her. "'The sun has set. We must go,' she said. But she made no movement. "'Whenever you are ready,' replied he. Just as the blaze died out of her eyes, so the flush faded out of her face. The whiteness stole back, and with it the sadness. He had to bite his tongue to keep from telling her what he felt, to keep from pouring out a thousand questions. But the privilege of having seen her, of having been with her when she had forgotten herself, that, he believed, was enough. It had been wonderful. It had made him love her. But it need not add to the tragedy of her life. Whatever that was, he tried to eliminate himself, and he watched her. Her eyes were fixed upon the gold-rimmed ramparts of the distant wall in the west. Plain it was how she loved that wild upland, and there seemed to be some haunting memory of the past in her gaze, some happy part of life, agonizing to think of now. "'We must go,' she said, and rose. Shefford rose to accompany her. She looked at him, and her haunting eyes seemed to want him to know that he had helped her to forget the present, to remember girlhood, and that somehow she would always associate a wonderful happy afternoon with him. He divined that her silence, then, was a Mormon seal on lips. "'Mary, this has been the happiest, the best, the most revealing day of my life,' he said simply. Swiftly, as if startled, she turned and faced down the slope. At the top of the wall above the village, she put on the dark hood, and with it that somber something which was Mormon. Twilight had descended into the valley, and shadows were so thick, Shefford had difficulty in finding Mary's bucket. He filled it at the spring and made offer to carry it home for her, which she declined. "'You'll come tonight later?' she asked. "'Yes,' he replied, hurriedly promising. Then he watched her white form slowly glide down the path to disappear in the shadows. Nas Te Bega and Joe were busy at the campfire. Shefford joined them. This night he was uncommunicative. Joe peered curiously at him in the flare of the blaze. Later, after the meal, when Shefford appeared restless and strode to and fro, Joe spoke up gruffly. "'Better hang around camp tonight.' Shefford heard, but did not heed. Nevertheless, the purport of the remark 
which was either jealousy or admonition, haunted him with the possibility of its meaning. He walked away from the campfire under the dark pinions out into the starry open, and every step was hard to take unless it pointed toward the home of the girl whose beauty and sadness and mystery had bewitched him. After what seemed hours, he took the well-known path toward her cabin, and then every step seemed lighter. He divined he was rushing to some fate. He knew not what. The porch was in shadow. He peered in vain for the white form against the dark background. In the silence, he seemed to hear his heartbeats thick and muffled. Some distance down the path he heard the sound of hoofs. Withdrawing in the gloom of a cedar, he watched. Soon he made out moving horses with riders. They filed past him to the number of half a score. Like a flash of fire, the truth burned him. Mormons come for one of those mysterious night visits to sealed wives. Shefford stalked far down the valley, into the lonely silence and the night shadows under the walls. End of Chapter 7, Part 2「Part One of the Rainbow Trail by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hogan of Naste Bega, Part One. The home of Naste Bega lay far up the cedared slope, with the craggy yellow cliffs and the black canyon and the pine-fringed top of Navajo Mountain behind, and to the fore the vast rolling descent of cedar groves and sage flats and sandy washes. No dim dark range made bold outline along the horizon. The stretch of gray and purple and green extended to the blue line of sky. Down the length of one sage level, Shefford saw a long lane where the brush and the grass had been beaten flat. This, the Navajo said, was a track where the young braves had raced their mustangs and had striven for supremacy before the eyes of maidens and the old people of the tribe. Naste Bega, did you ever race here? asked Shefford. I am a chief by birth, but I was stolen from my home, and now I cannot ride well enough to race the braves of my tribe, the Indian replied bitterly. In another place, Joe Lake halted his horse and called Shefford's attention to a big yellow rock lying along the trail, and then he spoke in Navajo to the Indian. "'I've heard of this stone. Isende, aha,' said Joe, after Naste Bega had spoken. "'Get down and let's see.' Shefford dismounted, but the Indian kept his seat in the saddle. Joe placed a big hand on the stone and tried to move it. According to Shefford's eye measurement, the stone was nearly oval, perhaps three feet high by a little over two in width. Joe threw off his sombrero, took a deep breath, and bending over, clasped the stone in his arms. He was an exceedingly heavy and powerful man, and it was plain to Shefford that he meant to lift the stone, if that were possible. Joe's broad shoulders strained, flattened, his arms bulged, his joints cracked, and his neck corded, and his face turned black. By gigantic effort, he lifted the stone and moved it about six inches. Then, as he released his hold, he fell, and when he sat up, his face was wet with sweat. Try it, he said to Shefford, with his lazy smile. See if you can heave it. Shefford was strong, and there had been a time when he took pride in his strength. Something in Joe's supreme effort and in the gloom of the Indian's eyes, made Shefford curious about this stone. He bent over and grasped it as Joe had done. He braced himself and lifted with all his power, until a red blur obscured his sight, and shooting stars seemed to explode in his head. But he could not even stir the stone. Shefford, maybe you'll be able to heft it some day, observed Joe. Then he pointed to the stone and addressed Naste Bega. The Indian shook his head and spoke for a moment. "'This is the Ascende Aha of the Navajos,' explained Joe. "'The young braves are always trying to carry this stone. As soon as one of them can carry it, he is a man. He who carries it farthest is the biggest man. 
and just so soon as any Indian can no longer lift it, he is old. Nas Te Bega says the stone has been carried two miles in his lifetime. His own father carried it the length of six steps. Well, it's plain to me that I am not a man, said Shefford, or else I am old. Joe Lake drawled his lazy laugh, and mounting, rode up the trail. But Shefford lingered beside the Indian. By nigh, said Nas Te Bega, I am chief of my tribe, but I have never been a man. I never lifted that stone. See what the pale-face education has done for the Indian. The Navajo's bitterness made Shefford thoughtful. Could greater injury be done to a man than this, to rob him of his heritage of strength? Joe drove the bobbing pack train of burros into the cedars, where the smoke of the Hogans curled upward, and soon the whistling of mustangs, the barking of dogs, the bleating of sheep told of his reception and presently Shefford was in the midst of an animated scene. Great, woolly, fierce dogs, like wolves, ran out to meet the visitors. Sheep and goats were everywhere, and little lambs scarcely able to walk, with others frisky and frolicsome. There were pure white lambs, and some that appeared to be painted, and some so beautiful with their fleecy white, all except black faces or ears or tails or feet, they ran right under Nack Yaw's legs and bumped against Shefford and kept bleeding their thin piped welcome. Under the cedars surrounding the several Hogans were mustangs that took Shefford's eye. He saw an iron gray with white mane and the tail sweeping to the ground and a fiery black, wilder than any other beast he had ever seen, and a pinto as wonderfully painted as the little lambs, and, most striking of all, a pure, cream-colored mustang, with grace and fine lines and beautiful mane and tail, and strange to see, eyes as blue as azure. This albino mustang came right up to Shefford, an action in singular contrast with that of the others, and showed a tame and friendly spirit toward him and Nack Yaw. Indeed, Shefford had reason to feel ashamed of Nack Yaw's temper or jealousy. The first Indians to put in an appearance were a flock of children, half-naked, with tangled manes of raven-black hair, and skin like golden bronze. They appeared bold and shy by turns. Then a little sinewy man, old and beaten and gray, came out of the principal Hogan. He wore a blanket round his bent shoulders. His name was Hostein Doten, and it meant gentle man. His fine, old, wrinkled face lighted with a smile of kindly interest. His squaw followed him, and she was as venerable as he. Shefford caught a glimpse of the shy, dark Glen Nespa, Naste Bega's sister, but she did not come out. Other Indians appeared, coming from adjacent Hogan's. Naste Bega turned the Mustangs loose among those Shefford had noticed, and presently there rose a snorting, whistling, kicking, plunging melee. A cloud of dust hid them, and a thudding of swift hoofs told of a run through the cedars. Joe Lake began picking over stacks of goatskins and bags of wool that were piled against the Hogan. Reckon we'll have one grand job packing out this load, he growled. It's not so heavy, but awkward to pack. It developed presently from talk with the old Navajo that this pile was only half of the load to be packed to Cayenta, and the other half was round the corner of the mountain in the camp of Paiutes. Hosteen Doton said he would send to the camp and have the Paiutes bring their share over. The suggestion suited Joe, who wanted to save his burrows as much as possible. Accordingly, a messenger was dispatched to the Paiute camp, and Shefford, with time on his hands and poignant memory, to combat, decided to recall his keen interest in the Navajo and learn, if possible, what the Indian's life was like. What would a day of his natural life be? In the gray of dawn, when the hush of the desert night still lay deep over the land, the Navajo stirred in his blanket and began to chant to the morning light. It began very soft and low, a strange, broken murmur, like the music of a brook and as it swelled, 
That weird and mournful tone was slowly lost in one of hope and joy. The Indian soul was coming out of night, blackness, the sleep that resembled death, into the day, the light that was life. Then he stood in the door of his hogan, his blanket round him, and faced the east. Night was lifting out of the clefts and ravines. The rolling cedar ridges and the sage flats were softly gray, with thin veils like smoke mysteriously rising and vanishing. The colorless rocks were changing. A long, horizon-wide gleam of light, rosiest in the center, lay low down in the east and momentarily brightened. One by one the stars in the deep blue sky paled and went out, and the blue dome changed and lightened. Night had vanished on invisible wings, and silence broke to the music of a mockingbird. The rose in the east deepened, a wisp of cloud turned gold. Dim distant mountains showed dark against the red, and low down in a notch a rim of fire appeared. Over the soft ridges and valleys crept a wondrous transfiguration. It was as if every blade of grass, every leaf of sage, every twig of cedar, the flowers, the trees, the rocks came to life at the sight of the sun. The red disk rose, and a golden fire burned over the glowing face of that lonely waste. The Navajo, dark, stately, inscrutable, faced the sun, his god. This was his great spirit. The desert was his mother, but the sun was his life. To the keeper of the winds and rains, to the master of light, to the maker of fire, to the giver of life, the Navajo sent up his prayer. Of all the good things of the earth, let me always have plenty. Of all the beautiful things of the earth, let me always have plenty. Peacefully, let my horses go, and peacefully, let my sheep go. God of the heavens, give me many sheep and horses. God of the heavens, help me to talk straight. Goddess of the earth, my mother, let me walk straight. Now all is well. Now all is well. Now all is well. Now all is well. Hope and faith were his. A chief would be born to save the vanishing tribe of Navajos. A bride would rise from a wind, kiss of the lilies in the moonlight. He drank from the clear, cold spring, bubbling from under mossy rocks. He went into the cedars, and the tracks in the trails told him of the visitors of night. His mustangs whistled to him from the ridgetops, standing clear with heads up, and manes flying, and then trooped down through the sage. The shepherd dogs, guardians of the flocks, barked him a welcome, and the sheep bleated, and the lambs pattered round him. In the hogan, by the warm red fire, his woman baked his bread, and cooked his meat, and he satisfied his hunger. Then he took choice meat to the hogan of a sick relative, and joined in the song and dance, and the prayer that drove away the evil spirit of illness. Down in the valley, in a sandy, sunny place, was his cornfield, and here he turned in the water from the ditch and worked a while, and went his contented way. He loved his people, his women, and his children. To his son, he said, be bold and brave, grow like the pine, work and ride and play, that you may be strong. Talk straight, love your brother, Give half to your friend. Honor your mother, that you may honor your wife. Pray, and listen to your gods. Then, with his gun and his mustang, he climbed the slope of the mountain. He loved the solitude, but he was never alone. There were voices on the wind, and steps on his trail. The lofty pine, the lichened rock, the tiny bluebell, the seared crag, all whispered their secrets. For him their spirits spoke. In the morning light, old Stoneface, the mountain, was a red god calling him to the chase. He was a brother of the eagle, at home on the heights where the winds swept and the earth lay revealed below. In the golden afternoon, with the warm sun on his back and the blue canyon at his feet, he knew the joy of doing nothing. He did not need rest, for he was never tired. The sage, sweet breath of the open was thick in his nostrils, 
The silence that had so many whisperings was all about him. The loneliness of the wild was his. His falcon eye saw mustang and sheep, the puffs of dust down on the cedar level, the Indian riding on a distant ridge, the gray walls and the blue clefts. He was home, still free, still wild, still untainted. He saw with the eyes of his ancestors. He felt them around him. They had gone into the elements from which their voices came on the wind. They were the watchers on his trails. At sunset he faced the west, and this was his prayer. Great Spirit, God of my fathers, keep my horses in the night. Keep my sheep in the night. Keep my family in the night. Let me wake to the day. Let me be worthy of the light. Now all is well. Now all is well. Now all is well. Now all is well. And he watched the sun go down, and the gold sink from the peaks, and the red die out of the west, and the gray shadows creep out of the canyon to meet the twilight and the slow, silent, mysterious approach of night with its gift of stars. Night fell. The white stars blinked. The wind sighed in the cedars. The sheep bleated. The shepherd dogs bayed the morning coyotes. And the Indian lay down in his blankets with his dark face tranquil in the starlight. All was well in his lonely world. Phantoms hovered. Illness lingered. Injury and pain and death were there. The shadows of a strange white hand flitted across the face of the moon. But now all was well. The Navajo had prayed to the God of his fathers. Now all was well. And this, thought Shefford, in revolt, was what the white man had killed in the Indian tribes, was reaching out now to kill in this wild remnant of the Navajos. The padre, the trapper, the trader, the prospector, and the missionary. So the white man had come, some of him good, no doubt, but more of him evil, and the young brave learned a thirst that could never be quenched at the cold, sweet spring of his forefathers, and the young maiden burned with a fever in her blood, and lost the sweet, strange, wild fancies of her tribe. End of Chapter 8, Part 1「Part Two of the Rainbow Trail by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hogan of Naste Bega, Part Two. Joe Lake came to Shefford and said, "Withers told me you had a mix-up with a missionary at Red Lake." "Yes, I regret to say," replied Shefford. "About Glen Nespa?" "Yes, Naste Bega's sister." Withers just mentioned it. Who was the missionary? Willits, so Presby the trader said. What he looked like. Shefford recalled the smooth brown face, the dark eyes, the weak chin, the mild expression, and the soft lax figure of the missionary. Can't tell by what you said, went on Joe, but I'll bet a peso to a horsehair that that's the fellow who's been here. Old Holstein Doton just told me. First visit, he ever had from the priest with the long gown. That's what he called the missionary. These old fellows will never forget what's come down from father to son about the Spanish padres. Well, anyway, Willits has been here twice after Glen Nespa. The old chap is impressed, but he doesn't want to let the girl go. I'm inclined to think Glen Nespa would as leaf go as stay. She may be a Navajo, but she's a girl. She won't talk much. "'Where's Neste Vega?' asked Shefford. "'He rode off somewhere yesterday, perhaps to the Paiute camp. "'These Indians are slow. "'They may take a week to pack that load over here. "'But if Neste Vega or someone doesn't come with a message today, "'I'll ride over there myself.' "'Joe, what do you think about this missionary?' queried Shefford, bluntly. "'Reckon there's not much to think, unless you see him or find out something.' I heard of Willits before Withers spoke of him. He's friendly with Mormons. I understand he's worked for Mormon interests, some way or other. That's on the quiet, Savvy. This matter of him coming after Glen Nespa, reckon that's all right. 
The missionaries all go after the young people. What'd be the use to try to convert the old Indians? No, the missionary's work is to educate the Indian, and of course, the younger he is, the better. You approve of the missionary? Shefford, if you understood a Mormon, you wouldn't ask that. Did you ever read or hear of Jacob Hamelin? Well, he was a Mormon missionary among the Navajos. The Navajos were as fierce as Apaches till Hamelin worked among them. He made them friendly to the white man. That doesn't prove he made converts of them, replied Shefford, still bluntly. No, for the matter of that, Hamblin let religion alone. He made presents, then traded with them, then taught them useful knowledge. Mormon or not, Shefford, I'll admit this. A good man, strong with his body, and learned in ways with his hands, and with some knowledge of medicine, can better the condition of these Indians. But just as soon as he begins to preach his religion, then his influence wanes. That's natural. These heathens have their ideals, their gods. Which the white man should leave them, replied Shefford, feelingly. That's a matter of opinion. But don't let's argue. Willits is after Glen Nespa, and if I know Indian girls, he'll persuade her to go to his school. Persuade her? Then Shefford broke off and related the incident that had occurred at Red Lake. Reckon any means justifies the end, replied Joe, imperturbably. Let him talk love to her, or rope her, or beat her, so long as he makes a Christian of her. Shefford felt a hot flush, and had difficulty in controlling himself. From this single point of view, the Mormon was impossible to reason with. That, too, is a matter of opinion. We won't discuss it, continued Shefford. But... If old Holstein Doton objects to the girl leaving, and if Ness de Vega does the same, won't that end the matter? Reckon not. The end of the matter is Glen Nespa. If she wants to go, she'll go. Shefford thought best to drop the discussion. For the first time, he had occasion to be repelled by something in this kind and genial Mormon, and he wanted to forget it, just as he had never talked about men to the sealed wives in the Hidden Valley, so he could not talk of women with Joe Lake. Neste Vega did not return that day, but next morning a messenger came, calling Lake to the Paiute camp. Shefford spent the morning high on the slope, learning more with every hour in the silence and loneliness that he was stronger of soul than he had dared to hope, and that the added pain which had come to him could be borne. Upon his return to camp in the cedar grove, he caught sight of Glen Nespa with the white man. They did not see him. When Shefford recognized Willits, an embarrassment, as well as an instinct, made him halt and step into a bushy, low-branched cedar. It was not his intention to spy on them. He merely wanted to avoid a meeting. But the missionary's hand on the girl's arm and her uplifted head her pretty face, strange, intent, troubled, struck Shefford with an unusual and irresistible curiosity. Willits was talking earnestly. Glen Nespa was listening intently. Shefford watched long enough to see that the girl loved the missionary and that he reciprocated, or was pretending. His manner scarcely savored of pretense, Shefford concluded, as he slipped away under the trees. He did not go at once into camp. He felt troubled and wished that he had not encountered the two. His duty in the matter, of course, was to tell Neste Vega what he had seen. Upon reflection, Shefford decided to give the missionary the benefit of the doubt, and if he really cared for the Indian girl and admitted or betrayed it, think all the better of him for the fact. Glen Nespa was certainly pretty enough and probably lovable enough to please any lonely man in this desert. The pain and the yearning in Shefford's heart made him lenient. He had to fight himself not to forget, for that was impossible, but to keep rational and sane when a white flower-like face haunted him and a voice called. The cracking of hard hoofs on stones caused him to turn toward the camp, and as he emerged from the cedar grove, he saw three Indian horsemen ride into the cleared space before the Hogans. They were superbly mounted, 
and well-armed and impressed him as being different from Navajos. Perhaps they were Paiutes. They dismounted and led the Mustangs down to the pool below the spring. Shefford saw another Mustang standing bridled down and carrying a pack behind the saddle. Some squaws with children hanging behind their skirts were standing at the door of Hosteen Doton's Hogan. Shefford glanced in to see Glen Nespa, pale, quiet, almost sullen. Willits stood with his hands spread. The old Navajo's seamed face worked convulsively as he tried to lift his bent form to some semblance of dignity, and his voice rolled out sonorously, Me no savvy, Jesus Christ. Me hungry. Me no eat, Jesus Christ. Shefford drew back, as if he had received a blow. That had been Hosteen Doton's reply to the importunities of the missionary. The old Navajo could work no longer. His sons were gone. His squaw was worn out. He had no one save Glen Nespa to help him. She was young, strong. He was hungry. What was the white man's religion to him? With long, swift stride, Shefford entered the Hogan. Willits, seeing him, did not look so mild as Shefford had him pictured in memory, nor did he appear surprised. Shefford touched Holstein Dalton's shoulder and said, Tell me. The aged Navajo lifted a shaking hand. Me no savvy, Jesus Christ. Me hungry. Me no eat, Jesus Christ. Shefford then made signs that indicated the missionary's intention to take the girl away. Him come, big talk, Jesus, all Jesus. Me no want Glen Nespa go, replied the Indian. Shefford turned to the missionary. Willits, is he a relative of the girl? There's some blood tie, I don't know what, but it's not close, replied Willits. Then don't you think you'd better wait till Neste Vega returns? He's her brother. What for? demanded Willits. That Indian may be gone a week. She's willing to accompany the missionary. Shefford looked at the girl. Glen Nespa, do you want to go? She was shy, ashamed, and silent, but manifestly willing to accompany the missionary. Shefford pondered a moment. How he hoped Neste Vega would come back. It was thought of the Indian that made Shefford stubborn. What a stand ought to be was hard to define, unless he answered to impulse, and here in the wilds he had become imbued with the idea that his impulses and instincts were no longer false. Willits, what do you want with the girl? queried Shefford, coolly, and at the question he seemed to find himself. He peered deliberately and searchingly into the other's face. The missionary's gaze shifted, and a tinge of red crept up from under his collar. "'Absurd thing to ask a missionary,' he burst out impatiently. "'Do you care for Glen Nespa?' "'I care as God's disciple, who cares to save the soul of heathen,' he replied, with the lofty tone of prayer. "'Has Glen Nespa no, no other interest in you except to be taught religion?' The missionary's face flamed, and his violent tremor showed that under his exterior there was a different man. "'What right have you to question me?' he demanded. "'You're an adventurer, an outcast. I have my duty here. I'm a missionary with church and state and government behind me.' "'Yes, I'm an outcast,' replied Shefford bitterly. "'And you may be all you say. But we're alone now, out here on the desert.' And this girl's brother is absent. You haven't answered me yet. Is there anything between you and Glen Nespa except religion? No, you insulting beggar. Shefford had forced the reply that he had expected, and which damned the missionary beyond any consideration. Willits, you are a liar, said Shefford steadily. And what are you? cried Willits in shrill fury. I heard all about you. Heretic, atheist driven from your church, hated and scorned for your blasphemy. Then he gave way to ungovernable rage, and cursed Shefford, as a religious fanatic might have cursed the most debased sinners. Shefford heard, with the blood beating, strangling the pulse in his ears. Somehow the missionary had learned his secret, more likely from the Mormons in Stonebridge, and the terms of disgrace were coals of fire upon Shefford's head. 
Strangely, however, he did not bow to them, as had been his humble act in the past, when his calumniators had arraigned and flayed him. Passion burned in him now, for the first time in his life, made a tiger of him, and these raw emotions, new to him, were difficult to control. "'You can't take the girl,' he replied, when the other had ceased, not without her brother's consent. "'I will take her.' Shefford threw him out of the Hogan and strode after him. Willits had stumbled. When he straightened up, he was white and shaken. He groped for the bridle of his horse while keeping his eyes upon Shefford, and when he found it, he whirled quickly, mounted, and rode off. Shefford saw him halt a moment under the cedars to speak with the three strange Indians, and then he galloped away. It came to Shefford then that he had been unconscious of the last strained moment of that encounter. He seemed all cold, tight, locked, and was amazed to find his hand on his gun. Verily, the wild environment had liberated strange instincts and impulses which he had answered. That he had no regrets proved how he had changed. Shefford heard the old woman scolding. Peering into the Hogan, he saw Glen Nespa flounce sullenly down, for all the world like any other thwarted girl. Hosteen Doton came out and pointed down the slope at the departing missionary. Heap talk Jesus, all talk, all Jesus, he exclaimed contemptuously. Then he gave Shefford a hard rap on the chest. Small talk, heap man. The matter appeared to be adjusted for the present, but Shefford felt that he had made a bitter enemy, and perhaps a powerful one. He prepared and ate his supper alone that evening, for Joe Lake and Neste Bega did not put in an appearance. He observed that the three strange Indians whom he took for Paiutes kept to themselves, and so far as he knew, had no intercourse with anyone at the camp. This would not have seemed unusual, considering the taciturn habit of Indians, had he not remembered seeing Willits speak to the trio. What had he to do with them? Shefford was considering the situation with vague doubts when, to his relief, the three strangers rode off into the twilight. Then he went to bed. He was awakened by violence. It was the gray hour before dawn. Dark forms knelt over him. A cloth pressed down hard over his mouth. Strong hands bound it while other strong hands held him. He could not cry out. He could not struggle. A heavy weight, evidently a man, held down his feet. Then he was rolled over, securely bound, and carried to be thrown like a sack over the back of a horse. All this happened so swiftly as to be bewildering. He was too astounded to be frightened. As he hung head downward, he saw the legs of a horse and a dim trail. A stirrup swung to and fro, hitting him in the face. He began to feel exceedingly uncomfortable, with a rush of blood to his head and cramps in his arms and legs. This kept on and grew worse for what seemed a long time. Then the horse was stopped, and a rude hand tumbled him to the ground. Again he was rolled over on his face, strong fingers plucked at his clothes, and he believed he was being searched. His captors were as silent as if they had been dumb. He felt when they took his pocketbook and his knife and all that he had. Then they cut, tore, and stripped off all his clothing. He was lifted, carried a few steps, and dropped upon what seemed a soft, low mound, and left lying there, still tied and naked. Shefford heard the rustle of sage and the dull thud of hoofs as his assailants went away. His first sensation was one of immeasurable relief. He had not been murdered. Robbery was nothing. And though roughly handled, he had not been hurt. He associated the assault with the three strange visitors of the preceding day. Still he had no proof of that. Not the slightest clue remained to help him ascertain who had attacked him. It might have been a short while or a long one. His mind was so filled with growing conjectures, but a time came when he felt cold. As he lay face down, only his back felt cold at first. He was grateful 
that he had not been thrown upon the rocks. The ground under him appeared soft, spongy, and gave somewhat as he breathed. He had really sunk down a little in this pile of soft earth. The day was not far off, as he could tell, by the brightening of the gray. He began to suffer with the cold, and then slowly he seemed to freeze and grow numb. In an effort to roll over upon his back, he discovered that his position, or his being bound, or the numbness of his muscles, was responsible for the fact that he could not move. Here was a predicament. It began to look serious. What would a few hours of the powerful sun do to his uncovered skin? Somebody would trail and find him. Still, he might not be found soon. He saw the sky lighten, turn rosy, and then gold. The sun shone upon him, but some time elapsed before he felt its warmth. All of a sudden a pain, like a sting, shot through his shoulder. He could not see what caused it, probably a bee. Then he felt another upon his leg, and about simultaneously with it a tiny, fiery stab in his side. A sickening sensation pervaded his body, slowly moving, as if poison had entered the blood of his veins. Then a puncture, as from a hot wire, entered the skin of his breast. Unmistakably it was a bite. By dint of great effort, he twisted his head to see a big red ant on his breast. Then he heard a faint sound, so exceedingly faint, that he could not tell what it was like. But presently his strained ears detected a slow, swift rustling, creeping sound, like the slipping rattle of an infinite number of tiny bits of moving gravel. Then it was a sound like the sweeping of wind-blown sand. Several hot bites occurred at once, and then, with his head twisted, he saw a red stream of ants pour out of the mound and spill over his quivering flesh. In an instant he realized his position. He had been dropped intentionally upon an ant heap, which had sunk with his weight, wedging him between the crusts, at the mercy of those terrible desert ants. A frantic effort to roll out proved futile, as did another and another. His violent muscular contractions infuriated the ants, and in an instant he was writhing in pain so horrible and so unendurable that he nearly fainted. But he was too strong to faint suddenly. A bath of vitriol, a stripping of his skin and red embers of fire thrown upon raw flesh could not have equaled this. There was fury in the bites and poison in the fangs of these ants. Was this an Indian's brutal trick, or was it the missionary's revenge? Shefford realized that it would kill him soon. He sweat what seemed the blood, although perhaps the blood came from the bites. A strange, hollow, buzzing roar filled his ears, and it must have been the pouring of the angry ants from their mound. Then followed a time that was all hell, worse than fire, for fire would have given merciful death, agony under which his physical being began spasmodically to jerk and wretch, and his eyeballs turned and his breast caved in. A cry rang through the roar in his ears. By nigh, by nigh. His fading sight seemed to shade round the dark face of Neste Bega. Then powerful hands dragged him from the mound, through the grass and sage, rolled him over and over, and brushed his burning skin with strong, swift sweep. End of Chapter 8 Part 29 of the Rainbow Trail by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the Desert Crucible. That hard experience was but the beginning of many cruel trials for John Shefford. He never knew who his assailants were, nor their motive other than robbery, and they had gotten little, for they had not found the large sum of money sewed in the lining of his coat. Joe Lake declared it was Shad's work and the Mormon showed the stern nature that lay hidden under his mild manner. Neste Bega shook his head and would not tell what he thought, but a somber fire burned in his eyes. 
The three started with a heavily laden pack train and went down the mountain slope into West Canyon. The second day they were shot at from the rim of the walls. Lake was wounded, hindering the swift flight necessary to escape deeper into the canyon. Here they hid for days while the Mormon recovered and the Indian took stealthy trips to try to locate the enemy. Lack of water and grass for the burrows drove them on. They climbed out of a side canyon, losing several burrows on a rough trail, and had proceeded to within half a day's journey of Red Lake when they were attacked while making camp in a cedar grove. Shefford sustained an exceedingly painful injury to his leg, but fortunately the bullet went through without breaking a bone. With that burning pain there came to Shefford the meaning of fight, and his rifle grew hot in his hands. Night alone saved the trio from certain fatality. Under the cover of darkness the Indian helped Shefford to escape. Joe Lake looked out for himself. The pack train was lost, and the Mustangs, except Nack Yaw. Shefford learned what it meant to lie out at night, listening for pursuit, cold to his marrow, sick with dread, and enduring frightful pain from a ragged bullet hole. Next day the Indian led him down into the Red Basin, where the sun shone hot and the sand reflected the heat. They had no water. A wind arose, and the valley became a place of flying sand. Through a heavy, stifling pall, Nas Te Bega somehow got Shefford to the trading post at Red Lake. Presby attended to Shefford's injury and made him comfortable. Next day, Joe Lake limped in, surly and somber, with the news that Shad and eight or ten of his outlaw gang had gotten away with the pack train. In short time, Shefford was able to ride, and with his companions went over the pass to Cayenta. Withers already knew of his loss, and all he said was that he hoped to meet Shad some day. Shefford showed a reluctance to go again to the hidden village in the silent canyon with the rounded walls. The trader appeared surprised, but did not press the point. Shefford meant sooner or later to tell him, yet never quite reached the point. The early summer brought more work for the little post, and Shefford toiled with the others. He liked the outdoor tasks, and at night was grateful that he was too tired to think. Then followed trips to Durango and Bluff and Monticello. He rode fifty miles a day for many days. He knew how a man fares who packs light and rides far and fast. When the Indian was with him, he got along well but Nas Te Bega would not go near the towns. Thus, many mishaps were Shefford's fortune. Many and many a mile he trailed his Mustang, for Nak Yaw never forgot the Sagi, and always headed for it when he broke his hobbles. Shefford accompanied an Indian teamster into Durango with a wagon and four wild Mustangs. Upon the return, with a heavy load of supplies, accident put Shefford in charge of the outfit. In despair, he had to face the hardest task that could have been given him, to take care of a crippled Indian, catch water, feed, harness, and drive four wild mustangs that did not know him, and tried to kill him at every turn, and get that precious load of supplies home to Cayenta. That he accomplished it proved the hint the possibilities of a man, for both endurance and patience. From that time he never gave up in the front of any duty. In the absence of an available Indian, he rode to Durango and back in record time. Upon one occasion, he was lost in a canyon for days, with no food and little water. Upon another, he went through a sandstorm in the open desert, facing it for forty miles and keeping to the trail. When he rode into Cayenta that night, the trader, in grim praise, said there was no worse to endure. At Monticello, Shefford stood off a band of desperadoes, and this time Shefford experienced a strange, sickening shock in the wounding of a man. Later he had other fights, but in none of them did he know whether or not he had shed blood. The heat of midsummer came, when the blistering sun shone, and a hot blast blew across the sand, and the furious storms made floods in the washes. Day and night Shefford was always in the open, and any one who had ever known him in the past would have failed to recognize him now. 
In the early fall with Nas Te Bega as companion, he set out to the south of Cayenta upon long-neglected business of the trader. They visited Red Lake, Blue Canyon, Keems Canyon, Oribe, the Moki Village, Tuba, Moen Kopi, and Moen Ave. This trip took many weeks and gave Shefford all the opportunity he wanted to study the Indians and the conditions nearer to the border of civilization. He learned the truth about the Indians and the missionaries. Upon the return trip, he rode over the trail he had followed alone to Red Lake and thence on to the Sagi, and it seemed that years had passed since he first entered this wild region which had come to be home, years that had molded him in the stern and fiery crucible of the desert. End of chapter 9《Part One of the Rainbow Trail》by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stonebridge, Part One. In October, Shefford arranged for a hunt in the Creshaw Mountains with Joe Lake and Nas Te Bega. The Indian had gone home for a short visit, and upon his return, the party expected to start. But Nas Te Bega did not come back. Then the arrival of a Paiute with news that excited Withers and greatly perturbed Lake convinced Shepard that something was wrong. The little trading post seldom saw such disorder. Certainly, Shepard had never known the trader to neglect work. Joe Lake threw a saddle on a Mustang he would have scorned to notice in an ordinary moment, and without a word of explanation or farewell, rode hard to the north on the Stonebridge Trail. Shefford had long since acquired patience. He was curious, but he did not care particularly what was in the wind. However, when Withers came out and sent an Indian to drive up the horses, Shefford could not refrain from a query. "'I hate to tell you,' replied the trader. "'Go on,' added Shefford quickly. "'Did I tell you about the government sending a Supreme Court judge out to Utah to prosecute the polygamists?' "'No,' replied Shefford. I forgot to, I reckon. You've been away a lot. Well, there's been hell up in Utah for six months. Lately this judge and his men have worked down in the southern Utah. He visited Bluff and Monticello a few weeks ago. Now, what do you think? Withers, is he coming to Stonebridge? He's there now. Someone betrayed the whereabouts of the hidden village over in the canyon. All the women have been arrested and taken to Stonebridge. The trial begins today. Arrested? echoed Shefford blankly. Those poor, lonely, good women? What on earth for? Sealed wives, exclaimed Withers tersely. The judge is after the polygamists. They say he's absolutely relentless. But women can't be polygamists. Their husbands are the ones wanted. Sure, but the prosecutors have got to find the sealed wives. The second wives to find the law-breaking husbands. That'll be a job, or I don't know Mormons. Are you going to ride over to Stonebridge with me? Shefford shrank at the idea. Months of toil and pain and travail had not been enough to make him forget the strange girl he had loved. But he had remembered only at poignant intervals, and the lapse of time had made thought of her a dream like that sad dream which had lured him into the desert. With the query of the traitor came a bittersweet regret. "'Better come with me,' said Withers. "'Have you forgotten the Sago Lily? "'She'll be put on trial, that girl, that child. "'Shefford, you know she hasn't any friends, "'and now no Mormon man to protect her, "'for fear of prosecution.' "'I'll go,' replied Shefford shortly. "'The Indian brought up the horses. "'Nak Yaw was thin from his long travels "'during the hot summer.' But he was hard as iron, and the way he pointed his keen nose toward the Sagi showed how he wanted to make for the upland country, with its clear springs and valleys of grass. Withers mounted his bay, and with a hurried farewell to his wife, spurred the Mustang into the trail. Shefford took time to get his weapons and the light pack he always carried, and then rode out after the trader. The pace Withers set was the long, steady lope, 
to which these Indian mustangs had been trained all their lives. In an hour they reached the mouth of the Sagi, and at sight of it it seemed to Shefford that the hard half-year of suffering since he had been there had disappeared. Withers, to Shefford's regret, did not enter the Sagi. He turned off to the north and took a wild trail into a split of the red wall, and wound in and out, and climbed a crack so narrow that the light was obscured and the cliffs could be reached from both sides of a horse. Once up on the wild plateau, Shefford felt again in a different world from the barren desert he had lately known. The desert had crucified him and had left him to die or survive, according to his spirit and his strength. If he had loved the glare, the endless level, the deceiving distance, the shifting sand, it had certainly not been as he loved this softer, wilder, more intimate upland. With the red peak shining up into the blue, and the fragrance of cedar and pinion, and the purple sage and flowers and grass, and splash of clear water over stones, with these there came back to him something that he had lost and which had haunted him. It seemed he had returned to this wild upland of color and canyon and lofty crags and green valleys and silent places with a spirit gained from victory over himself in the harsher and sterner desert below. And, strange to him, he found his old self, the dreamer, the artist, the lover of beauty, the searcher, for he knew not what, come to meet him on the fragrant wind. He felt this saw the old wildness with glad eyes, yet the greater part of his mind was given over to the thought of the unfortunate women he expected to see in Stonebridge. Withers was harder to follow, to keep up with, than an Indian. For one thing, he was a steady and tireless rider, and for another, there were times when he had no mercy on a horse. Then an Indian always found easier steps in a trail and shorter cuts. Withers put his mount to some bad slopes, and Shefford had no choice but to follow. But they crossed the great broken bench of upland without mishap, and came out upon a promontory of a plateau from which Shefford saw a wide valley and the dark green alfalfa fields of Stonebridge. Stonebridge lay in the center of a fertile valley surrounded by pink cliffs. It must have been a very old town, certainly far older than Bluff or Monticello, though smaller, and evidently it had been built to last. There was one main street, very wide, that divided the town, and was crossed at right angles by a stream spanned by a small, natural stone bridge. A line of poplar trees shaded each footpath. The little log cabins and stone houses and cottages were half hidden in foliage, now tinted with autumn colors. Toward the center of the town, the houses and stores and shops fronted upon the street and along one side of a green square or plaza. Here were situated several edifices, the most prominent of which was a church built of wood, whitewashed and remarkable, according to Withers, for the fact that not a nail had been used in its construction. Beyond the church was a large, low structure of stone with a split shingle roof and evidently this was the town hall. Shefford saw, before he reached the square, that this day in Stonebridge was one of singular action and excitement for a Mormon village. The town was full of people, and judging from the horses hitched everywhere and the big canvas-covered wagons, many of the people were visitors. A crowd surrounded the hall, a dusty, booted, spurred, shirt-sleeved, and sombreroed assemblage that did not wear the hallmark Shefford had come to associate with Mormons. They were riders, cowboys, horse wranglers, and some of them Shefford had seen in Durango. Navajos and Paiutes were present also, but they loitered in the background. Withers drew Shefford off to the side, where, under a tree, they hitched their horses. Never saw Stonebridge full of a riffraff gang, like this today, said Withers. I'll bet the Mormons are wild. There's a tough outfit from Durango. If they can get anything to drink, or if they've got it, Stonebridge will see smoke today. Come on, I'll get in that hall. 
But before Withers reached the hall, he started violently and pulled up short, then, with apparent unconcern, turned to lay a hand upon Shefford. The traitor's face had blanched, and his eyes grew hard and shiny like flint. He gripped Shefford's arm. "'Look over to your left,' he whispered. "'See that gang of Indians there by the big wagon? "'See the short Indian with the chaps? "'He's got a face big as a ham, dark fierce. "'That's Shad. "'You ought to know him. "'Shad and his outfit here. "'How's that for nerve? "'But he pulls a rein with the Mormons.' Shefford's keen eye took in a lounging group of ten or twelve Indians and several white men. They did not present any great contrast to the other groups, except that they were isolated, appeared quiet and watchful, and were all armed. A bunch of lean, racy mustangs, restive and spirited, stood nearby in charge of an Indian. Shefford had to take a second and closer glance to distinguish the half-breed. At once, he recognized in Shad the broad-faced squat Indian who had paid him a threatening visit that night long ago in the mouth of the Sagi. A fire ran along Shefford's veins and seemed to concentrate in his breast. Shad's dark, piercing eyes alighted upon Shefford and rested there. Then the half-breed spoke to one of his white outlaws and pointed at Shefford. His action attracted the attention of others in the gang and for a moment Shefford and Withers were treated to a keen-eyed stare. The traitor cursed low. Maybe I wouldn't like to mix it with that damned breed, he said. But what chance have we with that gang? Besides, we're here on other and more important business. All the same, before I forget, let me remind you that Shad has had you spotted ever since you came out here. A friendly Paiute told me only lately. Shefford, did any Indian between here and Flagstaff ever see that bunch of money you persist in carrying? Why, yes, I suppose so. Way back in Tuba, when I first came out, replied Shefford. Hmm, well, Shad's after that. Come on now, let's get inside the hall. The crowd opened for the trader, who appeared to be known to everybody. A huge man with a bushy beard blocked the way to a shut door. Hello, Meade, said Withers. Let us in. The man opened the door, permitted Withers and Shefford to enter, and then closed it. Shefford, coming out of the bright glare of the sun into the hall, could not see distinctly at first. His eyes blurred. He heard a subdued murmur of many voices. Withers appeared to be affected with the same kind of blindness, for he stood bewildered a moment. But he recovered sooner than Shefford, Gradually the darkness, shrouding many obscure forms, lifted. Withers drew him through a crowd of men and women to one side of the hall, and squeezed along a wall to a railing where progress was stopped. Then Shefford raised his head to look with bated breath and strange curiosity. The hall was large and had many windows. Men were in consultation upon a platform. Women, to the number of twenty, sat close together upon benches. Back of them stood another crowd. But the women on the benches held Shefford's gaze. They were the prisoners. They made a somber group. Some were hooded, some veiled, all clad in dark garments, except one on the front bench, and she was dressed in white. She wore a long hood that concealed her face. Shefford recognized the hood, and then the slender shape. She was Mary she whom her jealous neighbors had named the Sago Lily. At sight of her, a sharp pain pierced Shefford's breast. His eyes were blurred when he forced them away from her, and it took a moment for him to see clearly. Withers was whispering to him, or to someone near at hand, but Shefford did not catch the meaning of what was said. He paid more attention, however. Withers ceased speaking. Shefford gazed upon the crowd back of him. The women were hooded, and it was not possible to see what they looked like. They were many stalwart, clean-cut, young Mormons of Joe Lake's type, and these men appeared troubled, even distressed, and at a loss. There was little about them resembling the stern, quiet, somber austerity 
of the more mature men, and nothing at all of the strange, aloof, serene impassiveness of the gray-bearded old patriarchs. These venerable men were the Mormons of the old school, the sons of the pioneers, the ruthless fanatics. Instinctively, Shefford felt that it was in them that polygamy was embodied. They were the husbands of the sealed wives. He conceived an absorbing curiosity to learn if his instinct was correct, and hard upon that followed a hot, hateful eagerness to see which one was the husband of Mary. "'There's Bishop Kane,' whispered Withers, nudging Shefford, "'and there's Wagoner with him.' Shefford saw the bishop, and then beside him a man of striking presence. "'Who's Wagner?' asked Shefford, as he looked. "'He owns more than any Mormon in southern Utah,' replied the trader. "'He's the biggest man in Stonebridge, that's sure. "'But I don't know his relation to the church. "'They don't call him elder or bishop, but I'll bet he's some pumpkins. "'He never had any use for me or any Gentile. "'A closed fist, tight-lipped Mormon, a skin flint, if I ever saw one. "'Just look him over.' Shefford had been looking, and considered it unlikely that he would ever forget this individual called Wagner. He seemed old, sixty at least, yet at that only in the prime of a wonderful physical life. Unlike most of the others, he wore his grizzled beard close-cropped, so close that it showed the lean, wolfish line of his jaw. All his features were of striking sharpness, his eyes of a singularly brilliant blue, were yet cold and pale. The brow had a serious, thoughtful cast. Long furrows sloped down the cheeks. It was a strange, secretive face, full of power that Shefford had not seen in another man's, full of intelligence and thought that had not been used as Shefford had known them used among men. The face mystified him. It had so much more than the strange aloofness so characteristic of his fellows. "'Wagner had five wives and fifty-five children before the law went into effect,' whispered Withers. "'Nobody knows, and nobody will ever know, how many he's got now. That's my private opinion.' Somehow, after Withers told that, Shefford seemed to understand the strange power in Wagner's face. Absolutely it was not the force, the strength, given to a man from his years of control of men. Shefford, long schooled now in his fair-mindedness, fought down the feeling of other years and waited with patience. Who was he to judge Wagoner or any other Mormon? But whenever his gaze strayed back to the quiet, slender form in white, when he realized again and again the appalling nature of this court, his heart beat heavy and labored within his breast. Then a bustle among the men upon the platform appeared to indicate that proceedings were about to begin. Some men left the platform. Several sat down at a table upon which were books and papers, and others remained standing. These last were all roughly garbed in riding boots and spurs, and Shefford's keen eye detected the bulge of hidden weapons. They looked like deputy marshals upon duty. Somebody whispered that the judge's name was Stone. The name fitted him. He was not young, and looked a man suited to the prosecution of these secret Mormons. He had a ponderous brow, a deep, cavernous eye that emitted gleams but betrayed no color or expression. His mouth was the saving human feature of his stony face. Shefford took the man upon the judge's right hand to be a lawyer, and the one on his left an officer of the court, perhaps a prosecuting attorney. Presently, this fellow pounded upon the table and stood up as if to address a courtroom. Certainly he silenced that hall full of people. Then he perfunctorily and briefly stated that certain women had been arrested upon suspicion of being sealed wives of Mormon polygamists and were to be herewith tried by a judge of the United States Court. Shefford felt how the impressive words affected that silent hall of listeners, but he gathered from the brief preliminaries that the trial could not be otherwise than a crude, rapid investigation 
and perhaps for that the more sinister. End of Chapter 10, Part 1「Two of the Rainbow Trail by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stonebridge, Part Two. The first woman on the foremost bench was led forward by a deputy to a vacant chair on the platform just in front of the judge's table. She was told to sit down and showed no sign that she had heard. Then the judge courteously asked her to take the chair she refused. And Stone nodded his head as if he had experienced that sort of thing before. He stroked his chin wearily, and Shefford conceived an idea that he was a kind man, if he was a relentless judge. "'Please remove your veil,' requested the prosecutor. The woman did so, and proved to be young and handsome. Shefford had a thrill as he recognized her. She was Ruth, who had been one of his best-known acquaintances in the hidden village. She was pale, angry, almost sullen, and her breast heaved. She had no shame, but she seemed to be outraged. Her dark eyes, scornful and blazing, passed over the judge and his assistants, and on to the crowd behind the railing. Shefford, keen as a blade, with all his faculties absorbed, fancied he saw Ruth stiffen, and changed slightly as her glance encountered someone in that crowd. Then the prosecutor, in deliberate and chosen words, enjoined her to kiss the Bible, hand it to her, and swear to tell the truth. How strange for Shefford to see her kiss the book which she had studied for so many years. Stranger still to hear the low murmur from the listening audience as she took the oath. "'What is your name?' asked Judge Stone leaning back and fixing the cavernous eye upon her. Ruth Jones was the cool reply. How old are you? Twenty. Where were you born? went on the judge. He allowed time for the clerk to record her answers. Panguitch, Utah. Were your parents Mormons? Yes. Are you a Mormon? Yes. Are you a married woman? No. The answer was instant, cold, final. It seemed to the truth. Almost Shefford believed she spoke truth. The judge stroked his chin and waited a moment, and then hesitatingly he went on. Have you any children? No. And the blazing eyes met the cavernous ones. That about the children was true enough, Shefford thought, and he could have testified to it. You live in the hidden village near this town? Yes. What is the name of this village? It has none. Did you ever hear of Fredonia, another village far west of here? Yes. It is in Arizona, near the Utah line. There are few men there. Is it the same kind of village as this one in which you live? Yes. What does Fredonia mean? The name, has it any meaning? It means free women. The judge maintained silence for a moment, turned to whisper to his assistants, and presently, without glancing up, said to the woman, That will do. Ruth was led back to the bench, and the woman next to her brought forward. This was a heavier person, with the figure and step of a matured woman. Upon removing her bonnet, she showed the plain face of a woman of forty, and it was striking only in that strange, stony aloofness noted in the older men. Here, Shefford thought, was the real Mormon, different in a way he could not define from Ruth. This woman seated herself in the chair and calmly faced her prosecutors. She manifested no emotion whatsoever. Shefford remembered her and could not see any change in her deportment. This trial appeared to be of little moment to her, and she took the oath as if doing so had been a habit all her life. "'What is your name?' asked Judge Stone, glancing up from a paper he held. "'Mary Danton.' "'Family or married name? My husband's name was Danton.' "'Was? Is he living?' 
No. Where did you live when you were married to him? In St. George, and later here in Stonebridge. You were both Mormons? Yes. Did you have any children by him? Yes. How many? Two. Are they living? One of them is living. Judge Stone bent over his paper and then slowly raised his eyes to her face. Are you married now? No. Again the judge consulted his notes and held a whispered colloquy with the two men at his side. Mrs. Danton, when you were arrested, there were five children found in your home. To whom do they belong? Me. Are you their mother? Yes. Your husband Danton is the father of only one, the eldest, according to your former statement. Is that correct? Yes. Who, then, is the father, or who are the fathers, of your other children? I do not know. She said it with the most stony-faced calmness, with utter disregard of what significance her words had. A strong mystic wall of cold flint insulated her. Strangely, it came to Shefford how impossible either to doubt or to believe her. Yet he did both. Judge Stone showed a little heat. You don't know the father of one or all of these children, he queried, with sharp, rising inflection of voice. I do not. Madam, I beg to remind you that you are under oath. The woman did not reply. These children are nameless, then, illegitimate? They are. You swear you are not the sealed wife of some Mormon? I swear. How do you live, maintain yourself? I work. What at? I weave, sew, bake, and work in my garden. My men made note of your large and comfortable cabin, even luxurious, considering this country. How is that? My husband left me comfortable. Judge Stone shook a warning finger at the defendant. Suppose I were to sentence you to jail for perjury for a year, far from your home and children. Would you speak, tell the truth? I am telling the truth. I can't speak what I don't know. Send me to jail. Baffled, with despairing, angry impatience, Judge Stone waved the woman away. That will do for her. Fetch the next one, he said. One after another he examined three more women, and arrived, by various questions and answers, different in tone and temper, at precisely the same point as had been made in the case of Mrs. Danton. Thereupon the proceedings rested a few moments, while the judge consulted with his assistants. Shefford was grateful for this respite. He had been worked up to an unusual degree of interest, and now, as the next Mormon woman to be examined, was she whom he loved, and loved still, he felt rise in him emotion that threatened to make him conspicuous unless it could be hidden. The answers of these Mormon women had been not altogether unexpected by him, but once spoken in cold blood under oath, how tragic, how appallingly significant of the shadow, the mystery, the yoke that bound them. He was amazed, saddened. He felt bewildered. He needed to think out the meaning of the falsehoods of women he knew to be good and noble. Surely religion, instead of fear and loyalty, was the foundation and the strength of this disgrace, this sacrifice. Absolutely. Shame was not in these women, though they swore to shameful facts. They had been coached to give these baffling answers, every one of which seemed to brand them, not the brazen mothers of illegitimate offspring, but faithful, unfortunate, sealed wives. To Shefford, the truth was not in their words, but it sat upon their somber brows. Was it only his heightened imagination, or did the silence and the suspense grow more intense when a deputy led that dark-hooded, white-clad, slender woman to the defendant's chair? She did not walk with the poise that had been manifest in the other women, and she sank into the chair as if she could no longer stand. "'Please remove your hood,' requested the prosecutor. How well Shefford remembered the strong, shapely hands. He saw them tremble at the knot of ribbon, and that tremor 
was communicated to him in a sympathy which made his pulses beat. He held his breath while she removed the hood. And then there was revealed, he thought, the loveliest and the most tragic face that ever was seen in a courtroom. A low, whispering murmur that swelled like a wave ran through the hall, and by it Shefford divined, as clearly as if the fact had been blazoned on the walls, that Mary's face had been unknown to these villagers. But the name Sago Lily had not been unknown. Shefford heard it whispered on all sides. The murmuring subsided. The judge and his assistants stared at Mary. As for Shefford, there was no need of his personal feeling to make the situation dramatic. Not improbably, Judge Stone had tried many Mormon women, but manifestly this one was different. Unhooded, Mary appeared to be only a young girl, and a court, confronted suddenly with her youth and the suspicion attached to her, could not but have been shocked. Then her beauty made her seem, in that somber company, indeed, the white flower for which she had been named. But more likely, it was her agony that bound the court into silence, which grew painful. Perhaps the thought that flashed in the shepherd's mind was telepathic. It seemed to him that every watcher there realized that in this defendant the judge had a girl of softer mold, of different spirit, and from her the bitter truth could be wrung. Mary faced the court and the crowd on that side of the platform. Unlike the other women, she did not look at or seem to see anyone behind the railing. Shefford was absolutely sure there was not a man or woman who caught her glance. She gazed afar, with eyes strained, humid, fearful. When the prosecutor swore her to the oath, her lips were seen to move, but no one heard her speak. "'What is your name?' asked the judge. "'Mary.' Her voice was low, with a slight tremor. "'What's your other name?' "'I won't tell.' Her singular reply, the tones of her voice, her manner before the judge, marked her with strange simplicity. It was evident that she was not accustomed to questions." What were your parents' names? I won't tell, she replied very low. Judge Stone did not press the point. Perhaps he wanted to make the examination as easy as possible for her, or to wait till she showed more composure. Were your parents Mormons, he went on? No, sir, she added the sir with a quaint respect, contrasting markedly with the short replies of the women before her. Then you were not born a Mormon? No, sir. How old are you? Seventeen or eighteen, I'm not sure. You don't know your exact age? No. Where were you born? I won't tell. Was it in Utah? Yes, sir. How long have you lived in this state? Always, except last year. And that's been over in the hidden village where you were arrested? Yes. But you often visited here, this town Stonebridge. I never was here till yesterday. Judge Stone regarded her as if his interest as a man was running counter to his duty as an officer. Suddenly he leaned forward. Are you a Mormon now? he queried forcibly. No, sir, she replied, and here her voice rose a little clearer. It was an unexpected reply. Judge Stone stared at her. The low buzz ran through the listening crowd, and as for Shefford, he was astounded. When his wits flashed back, and he weighed her words, and saw in her face truth as clear as light, he had the strangest sensation of joy. Almost it flooded away the gloom and pain that attended this ordeal. The judge bent his head to his assistants as if for counsel. All of them were eager where formerly they had been weary. Shefford glanced around at the dark and somber faces, and a slow wrath grew within him. Then he caught a glimpse of Wagoner. The steel-blue, piercing intensity of the Mormon's gaze impressed him at a moment when all that older generation of Mormons 
looked as hard and immutable as iron. Either Shefford was overexcited and mistaken, or the hour had become fraught with greater suspense. The secret, the mystery, the power, the hate, the religion of a strange people were thick and tangible in that hall. For Shefford, the feeling of the presence of Withers on his left was entirely different from that of the Mormon on his other side. If there was not a shadow there, then the sun did not shine so brightly as it had shone when he entered. The air seemed clogged with nameless passion. "'I gather that you've lived mostly in the country, away from people,' the judge began. "'Yes, sir,' replied the girl. "'Do you know anything about the government of the United States?' "'No, sir.' He pondered again, evidently weighing his queries, leading up to the fatal and inevitable question. Still his interest in this particular defendant had become visible. "'Have you any idea of the consequences of perjury?' "'No, sir. Do you understand what perjury is?' "'It's to lie.' "'Do you tell lies?' "'No, sir. Have you ever told a single lie?' "'Not yet,' she replied, almost whispering. It was the answer of a child, and affected the judge. He fussed with his papers. Perhaps his task was not easy. Certainly it was not pleasant. Then he leaned forward again and fixed those deep, cavernous eyes upon the sad face. "'Do you understand what a sealed wife is?' I've never been told. But you know there are sealed wives in Utah? Yes, sir, I've been told that. Judge Stone halted there, watching her. The hall was silent except for faint rustlings, and here and there deep breaths drawn guardedly. The vital question hung like a sword over the white-faced girl. Perhaps she divined the impending stroke, for she sat like a stone with dilating, appealing eyes upon her executioner. "'Are you a sealed wife?' he flung at her. She could not answer at once. She made effort, but the words would not come. He flung the question again, sternly. "'No,' she cried. And then there was silence. That poignant word quivered in Shefford's heart. He believed it was a lie. It seemed he would have known it if this hour was the first in which he had ever seen the girl. He heard, he felt, he sensed the fatal thing. The beautiful voice had lacked some quality before present, and the thing wanting was something subtle, an essence, a beautiful ring, the truth. What a hellish thing to make that pure girl a liar, a perjurer. The heat deep within Shefford kindled the fire. "'You are not married,' went on Judge Stone." No, sir, she answered faintly. Have you ever been married? No, sir. Do you expect ever to be married? Oh, no, sir. She was ashen pale now, quivering all over, with her strong hands clasping the black hood, and she could no longer meet the judge's glance. Have you any, any children? The judge asked haltingly. It was a hard question to get out. No. Judge Stone leaned far over the table, and that his face was purple showed Shefford he was a man. His big fist clenched. Girl, you're not going to swear you, too, were visited over there by men. You're not going to swear that? Oh, no, sir. Judge Stone settled back in his chair, and while he wiped his moist face, the same foreboding murmur, almost a menace, moaned through the hall. Shefford was sick in his soul, and afraid of himself. He did not know this spirit that flamed up in him. His helplessness was a most hateful fact. "'Come, confess you are a sealed wife,' called her interrogator. She maintained silence, but shook her head. Suddenly he seemed to leap forward. "'Unfortunate child, confess!' That forced her to lift her head and face him, Yet still she did not speak. It was the strength of despair. She could not endure much more. "'Who is your husband?' he thundered at her. She rose wildly, terror-stricken. It was terror that dominated her, not of the stern judge, 
for she took a faltering step toward him, lifting a shaking hand, but of someone or of something far more terrible than any punishment she could have received in the sentence of a court. Still, she was not proof against the judge's will. She had weakened, and the terror must have been because of that weakening. "'Who is the Mormon who visits you?' he thundered relentlessly. "'I never knew his name.' "'But you'd know his face. I'll arrest every Mormon in this country and bring him before you. You know his face?' "'Oh, I wouldn't. I couldn't tell. I never saw his face in the light.' The tragic beauty of her, the certainty of some monstrous crime to youth and innocence, the presence of an agony and terror that unfathomably seemed not to be for herself, these transfixed the court and the audience and held them silenced till she reached out blindly and then sank in a heap to the floor. End of Chapter 10 Part 2《Part One of the Rainbow Trail by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. After the Trial, Part One. Shefford might have leaped over the railing, but for Withers' restraining hand. And when there appeared to be some sign of kindness in those other women for the unconscious girl, Shefford squeezed through the crowd and got out of the hall. The gang outside that had been denied admittance pressed upon Shefford with jest and curious query, and a good nature that jarred upon him. He was far from gentle as he jostled off the first importuning fellows. The others, gaping at him, opened the lane for him to pass through. Then there was a hand laid on his shoulder that he did not shake off. Nas Te Bega loomed dark and tall beside him. Neither the traitor nor Joe Lake nor any white man Shefford had met influenced him as this Navajo. Nas Te Bega, you're here too? I guess the whole country is here. We waited at Cayenta. What kept you so long? The Indian, always slow to answer, did not open his lips till he drew Shefford apart from the noisy crowd. By nigh, there is sorrow in the Hogan of Hosteen Doton, he said. Glen Nespa, exclaimed Shefford. My sister is gone from the home of her brother. She went away alone in the summer. Blue Canyon? She went to the missionary? Nas Te Bega, I thought I saw her there, but I wasn't sure. I didn't want to make sure. I was afraid it might be true. A brave who loved my sister trailed her there. Nas Te Bega, will you? Will we go find her? Take her home? No, she will come home some day. What bitter sadness and wisdom in his words. But my friend, that damned missionary, began Shefford, passionately. The Indian had met him at a bad hour. Willits is here. I saw him go in there, interrupted Nas Te Bega, and he pointed to the hall. Here? He gets around a good deal, declared Shefford. Nas Te Bega, what are you going to do to him? The Indian held his peace, and there was no telling from his inscrutable face what might be in his mind. He was dark and passive. He seemed a wise and bitter Indian, beyond any savagery of his tribe, and the suffering Shefford divined was deep. "'He'd better keep out of my sight,' muttered Shefford, more to himself than to his companion. "'The half-breed is here,' said Nas Te Bega. "'Shad? Yes, we saw him, too. There. He's still with his gang. Nas Te Bega, what are they up to? They will steal what they can. Withers says Shad is friendly with the Mormons. Yes, and with the missionaries, too. With Willets? I saw them talk together, strong talk. Strange, but maybe it's not so strange. Shad is known well in Monticello and Bluff. He spends money there. They are afraid of him, but he's welcome just the same. Perhaps everybody knows him. It'd be like him to ride in the Cayenta. But, Nas Te Bega, I've got to look out for him, because Withers says he's after me. By nigh wears a scar that is proof, said the Indian. 
then it must be he found out long ago I had a little money. It might be, but by nigh the half-breed has a strange step on your trail. What do you mean? demanded Shefford. Nas Te Bega cannot tell what he does not know, replied the Navajo. Let that be. We shall know some day. By nigh, there is sorrow to tell that is not the Indians. Sorrow for my brother. Shefford lifted his eyes to the Indians, and if he did not see sadness there, he was much deceived. By nigh, long ago, you told a story to the trader. Nas Te Bega sat before the fire that night. You did not know he could understand your language. He listened and he learned what brought you to the country of the Indian. That night he made you his brother. All his lonely rides into the canyon have been to find the little golden-haired child, the lost girl, Fay Larkin. By nigh, I have found the girl you wanted for your sweetheart. Shefford was bereft of speech. He could not see steadily, and the last solemn words of the Indian seemed far away. By nigh, I have found Fay Larkin, repeated Nas Te Bega. Fay Larkin, gasped Shefford, shaking his head. But she's dead. It would be less sorrow for Bai Nye if she were dead. Shefford clutched at the Indian. There was something terrible to be revealed. Like an aspen leaf in the wind, he shook all over. He divined the revelation, divined the coming blow. But that was as far as his mind got. She's in there, said the Indian, pointing toward the hall. Fay Larkin, whispered Shefford. Yes, by nigh. My God, how do you know? Oh, I could have seen. I've been blind. Tell me, Indian, which one? Fay Larkin is the Sago Lily. Shefford strode away into a secluded corner of the square, where in the shade and quiet of the trees he suffered a storm of heart and mind. During that short or long time, he had no idea how long, the Indian remained with him. He never lost the feeling of Nas Te Bega close beside him. When the period of acute pain left him, and some order began to replace the tumult in his mind, he felt in Nas Te Bega the same quality, silence or strength or help, that he had learned to feel in the deep canyon and the lofty crags. He realized then that the Indian was indeed a brother, and Shefford needed him. What he had to fight was more fatal than suffering and love. It was hate rising out of the unsuspected dark gulf of his heart, the instinct to kill, the murder in his soul. Only now did he come to understand Jane Witherstein's tragic story, and the passion of Venters, and what had made Lassiter a gunman. The desert had transformed Shefford. The elements had entered into his muscle and bone, into the very fiber of his heart. Sun, wind, sand, cold, storm, space, stone, the poison cactus, the racking toil, the terrible loneliness. The iron of the desert man, the cruelty of the desert savage, the wildness of the mustang, the ferocity of hawk and wolf the bitter struggle of every surviving thing. These were as if they had been melted and merged together, and now made a dark and passionate stream that was his throbbing blood. He realized what he had become, and gloried in it, yet there, looking on with grave and earnest eyes, was his old self, the man of reason, of intellect, of culture, who had been a good man despite the failure and shame of his life and he gave heed to the voice of warning of conscience. Not by revengefully seeking the Mormon, who had ruined Fay Larkin, and blindly dealing a wild justice, could he help this unfortunate girl. This fierce, newborn strength and passion must be tempered by reason, lest he become merely elemental, a man answering wholly to primitive impulses. In the darkness of that hour he mined deep into his heart, understood himself, trembled at the thing he faced, and won his victory. He would go forth from that hour a man. He might fight, and perhaps there was death in the balance, but hate would never overthrow him. 
Then when he looked at future action, he felt a strange, unalterable purpose to save Fay Larkin. She was very young. Seventeen or eighteen, she had said, and there could be, there must be some happiness before her. It had been his dream to chase a rainbow. It had been his determination to find her in the lost Surprise Valley. Well, he had found her. It never occurred to him to ask Nas Te Bega how he had discovered that Sago Lily was Fay Larkin. The wonder was, Shefford thought, that he had so long been blind himself. How simply everything worked out now. Every thought, every recollection of her was proof. Her strange beauty like that of the sweet and rare Lily. Her low voice that showed the habit of silence. Her shapely hands with the clasp strong as a man's. Her lithe form, her swift step. Her wonderful agility upon the smooth, steep trails and the wildness of her upon the heights, and the haunting, brooding shadow of her eyes when she gazed across the canyon. All these fitted so harmoniously the conception of a child lost in a beautiful surprise valley and growing up in its wildness and silence, tutored by the sad love of broken Jane and Lassiter. Yes, the savor had been Shefford's dream, and he had loved that dream, he had loved the dream, and he had loved the child. The secret of her hiding place, as revealed by the story, told him, and his slow growth from dream to action, these had strangely given Fay Larkin to him. Then had come the bitter knowledge that she was dead. In the light of this subsequent revelation, how easy to account for his loving Mary, too. Never would she be Mary again to him. Fay Larkin and the Sago Lily were one and the same. She was here, near him, and he was powerless for the present to help her or to reveal himself. She was held back there in that gloomy hall among those somber Mormons, alien to the women, bound in some fatal way to one of the men, and now by reason of her weakness in the trial, surely to be hated. Thinking of her past and her present, of the future, and that secret Mormon whose face she had never seen, Shefford felt a sinking of his heart, a terrible cold pang in his breast, a fainting of his spirit. She had sworn she was no sealed wife, but had she not lied? So then, how utterly powerless he was. But here to save him, to uplift him, came that strange mystic insight which had been the gift of the desert to him. She was not dead. He had found her. What mattered obstacles, even that implacable creed to which she had been sacrificed, in the face of this blessed and overwhelming truth? It was as mighty as the love suddenly dawning upon him. A strong and terrible and deathly sweet wind seemed to fill his soul with the love of her. It was her fate that had drawn him, and now it was her agony, her innocence, her beauty, that bound him for all time. Patience and cunning and toil, passion and blood, the unquenchable spirit of a man to save, these were nothing to give. Life itself were little, could he but free her. Patience and cunning, his sharpening mind cut these out as his greatest assets for the present, and his thoughts flashed like light through his brain. Judge Stone and his court would fail to convict any Mormon in Stonebridge, just the same as they had failed to convict in the northern towns. They would go away, and Stonebridge would fall to the slow, sleepy tenor of its former way. The hidden village must become known to all men, honest and outlawed in that country, but this fact would hardly make any quick change in the plans of the Mormon. They did not soon change. They would send the sealed wives back to the canyon, and after the excitement had died down, visit them as usual. Nothing, perhaps, would ever change these old Mormons but death. Shefford resolved to remain in Stonebridge and ingratiate himself deeper into the regard of the Mormons. He would find work there if the sealed wives were not returned to the hidden village. In case the women went back to the valley, Shefford meant to resume his old duty of driving Withers' pack trains. Wanting that opportunity, 
he would find some other work, some excuse to take him there. In due time, he would reveal to Fay Larkin that he knew her. How the thought thrilled him. She might deny, might persist in her fear, might fight to keep her secret. But he would learn it, hear her story, hear what had become of Jane Witherstein and Lassiter. And if they were alive, which now he believed, he would find them, and he would take them and Fay out of the country. The duty, the great task, held a grim fascination for him. He had a foreboding of the cost. He had a dark realization of the force he meant to oppose. There were duty here, and pity, and unselfish love, but these alone did not actuate Shefford. Mystically, fate seemed again to come like a gleam and bid him follow. When Shefford and Nas Te Bega returned to the town hall, the trial had been ended, the hall was closed, and only a few Indians and cowboys remained in the square, and they were about to depart. On the street, however, and the paths, and in the doorways of stores were knots of people, talking earnestly. Shefford walked up and down, hoping to meet Withers or Joe Lake. Nas Te Bega said he would take the horses to water and feed, and then return. There were indications that Stonebridge might experience some of the excitement and perhaps violence common to towns like Monticello and Durango. There was only one saloon in Stonebridge, and it was full of roistering cowboys and horse wranglers. Shefford saw the bunch of mustangs in charge of the same Indian that belonged to Shad and his gang. The men were inside drinking. Next door was a tavern called Hopewell House, a stone structure of some pretensions. There were Indians lounging outside. Shefford entered through a wide door and found himself in a large bare room, boarded like a loft, with no ceiling except the roof. The place was full of men and noise. Here he encountered Joe Lake, talking to Bishop Kane and other Mormons. Shefford got a friendly greeting from the bishop, and then was well received by the strangers to whom Joe introduced him. "'Have you seen Withers?' asked Shefford. "'Reckon he's around somewhere,' replied Joe. "'Better hang up here, for he'll drop in sooner or later.' "'When are you going back to Kayenta? went on Shefford. "'Hard to say. We'll have to call off our hunt. Naste Bega is here, too. "'Yes, I've been with him.' The older Mormons drew aside, and then Joe mentioned the fact that he was half-starved. Shefford went with him into another clappered room, which was evidently a dining room. There were half a dozen men at the long table. The seat at the end was a box, and scarcely large enough or safe enough for Joe and Shefford, but they risked it. "'Saw you in the hall,' said Joe. "'Hell, wasn't it?' "'Joe, I never knew how much I dare say to you, so I don't talk much. But it was hell,' replied Shefford. "'You needn't be so scared of me,' spoke up Joe testily. That was the first time Shefford had heard the Mormon speak that way. "'I'm not scared, Joe, but I like you, respect you. I can't say so much of, of your people.' "'Did you stick out the whole mix?' asked Joe. "'No, I had enough when, when they got through with Mary.' Shefford spoke low and dropped his head. He heard the Mormon grind his teeth. There was silence for a little space, while neither man looked at the other. "'Reckon the judge was pretty decent,' presently said Joe. "'Yes, I thought so. He might have. But Shefford did not finish that sentence. How'd the thing end? It ended all right. Was there no conviction, no sentence? Shefford felt a curious eagerness. "'Nah,' he snorted. "'The court might have saved its breath. I suppose.' Well, Joe, between you and me, as old friends now, that trial established one fact, even if it couldn't be proved. Those women are sealed wives. Joe had no reply for that. He looked gloomy, and there was a stern line in his lips. Today he seemed more like a Mormon. Judge Stone knew that, as well as I knew, went on Shefford. Any man of penetration could have seen it. 
What an ordeal that was for good women to go through. I know they're good. And there they were, swearing to. Didn't it make me sick, interrupted Joe, in a kind of growl. Reckon it made Judge Stone sick, too. After Mary went under, he conducted that trial like a man cutting out steers at a roundup. He wanted to get it over. He never forced any question. Bad job to ride down Stonebridge Way. It's out of creation. There's only six men in the party with a poor lot of horses. Really, government officers or not, they're not safe. And they've taken a hunch. Have they left already? inquired Shefford. We're packed an hour ago. I didn't see them go, but somebody said they went. Took the trail for Bluff, which is sure the only trail they could take. Unless they wanted to go to Colorado by way of Cayenta, that might have been the safest trail. Joe, what might happen to them? asked Shefford, quietly, with eyes on the Mormon. Ah, oh, you know that rough trail. Bad on horses, weathered slopes, slipping ledges. A rock might fall on you any time. Then Shad's here with his gang, and bad Paiutes. What became of the women? Shefford asked presently. They're around among friends. Where are their children? Left over there with the old women. Couldn't be fetched over. But there are some pretty young babies in that bunch. Need their mothers. I should think so, replied Shefford constrainedly. When will their mothers get back to them? Tonight, maybe. If this mob of cowpunchers and wranglers get out of town. It's a bad mix, Shefford. Here's a hunch on that. These fellows will get full of whiskey, and trouble might come if they approach the women. You mean they might get drunk enough to take the oaths of those poor women, take the meaning literally, pretend to believe the women what they swore they were? Reckon you've got the hunch, replied Joe gloomily. My God, man, that would be horrible, exclaimed Shefford. Horrible or not, it's liable to happen. The women can be kept here yet a while. Reckon there won't be any trouble here. It'll be over there in the valley. Shefford, getting the women over there safe is a job that's been put to me. I've got a bunch of fellows already. Can I count on you? I'm glad to say you're well thought of. Bishop Kane likes you, and what he says goes. Yes, Joe, you can count on me, replied Shefford. End of Chapter 11 Part 1「Two of the Rainbow Trail by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. After the Trial, Part Two. They finished their meal and then repaired to the big office room of the house. Several groups of men were there, and loud talk was going on outside. Shefford saw Withers talking to Bishop Kane and two other Mormons, both strangers to Shefford. The trader appeared to be speaking with unwanted force, emphasizing his words with energetic movements of his hands. "'Reckon something's up,' whispered Joe hoarsely. "'It's been in the air all day.' Withers must have been watching for Shefford. "'Here's Shefford now,' he said to the trio of Mormons, as Joe and Shefford reached the group. "'I want you to hear him speak for himself.' "'What's the matter?' asked Shefford. Give me a hunch, and I'll put in my say-so, said Joe Lake. Shefford, it's the matter of a good name more than a job, replied the trader. A little while back, I told the bishop, I meant to put you on the pack job over to the valley, same as when you first came to me. Well, the bishop was pleased and said he might put something in your way. Just now, I ran in here to find you not wanted. When I kicked, I got the straight hunch. Willits has said things about you. One of them, one that sticks in my craw, was that you'd do anything, even pretend to be inclined toward Mormonism, just to be among those Mormon women over there. Willits is your enemy, and he's worse than I thought. Now I want you to tell Bishop Kane why this missionary is bitter toward you. Gentlemen, I knocked him down, replied Shefford simply. "'What for?' inquired the bishop, in surprise and curiosity. 
Shefford related the incident which had occurred at Red Lake, and that now seemed again to come forward fatefully. "'You insinuate he had evil intent toward the Indian girl?' queried Kane. "'I insinuate nothing. I merely state what led to my acting as I did.' "'Principles of religion, sir?' "'No, a man's principles.' Withers interposed in his blunt way. "'Bishop, did you ever see Glen Nespa?' "'No. She's the prettiest Navajo in the country. Willits was after her, that's all.' "'My dear man, I can't believe that of a Christian missionary. We've known Willits for years. He's a man of influence. He has money back of him. He's doing a good work. You hint of a love relation?' "'No, I don't hint,' replied Withers impatiently. "'I know. "'It's not the first time I've known a missionary to do this sort of thing. "'Nor is it the first time for Willits. "'Bishop Kane, I live among the Indians. "'I see a lot I never speak of. "'My work is to trade with the Indians, that's all. "'But I'll not have Willits or any other damned hypocrite run down my friend here. "'John Shefford is the finest young man that ever came to me in the desert. And he's got to be put right before you all, or I'll not set foot in Stonebridge again. Willits was after Glen Nespa. Shefford punched him. And later threw him out of the old Indian's Hogan up on the mountain. That explains Willits' enmity. He was after the girl. What's more, gentlemen, he got her, added Shefford. Glen Nespa has not been home for six months. I saw her at Blue Canyon. I would like to face this, Willits, before you all. Easy enough, replied Withers, with a grim chuckle. He's just outside. The trader went out. Joe Lake followed at his heels, and the three Mormons were next. Shefford brought up the rear and lingered in the door while his eyes swept the crowd of men and Indians. His feeling was in direct contrast to his movements. He felt the throbbing of fierce anger, but it seemed the face came between him and his passion. A sweet and tragic face that would have had power to check him in a vastly more critical moment than this. And in an instant he had himself in hand and strangely, suddenly, felt the strength that had come to him. Willett stood in earnest colloquy with a short, squat Indian, the half-breed Shad. They leaned against the hitching rail. Other Indians were there, and outlaws. It was a mixed group, rough and hard-looking. "'Hey, Willits,' called the trader, and his loud, ringing voice, not pleasant, stilled the movement and sound. When Willits turned, Shefford was halfway across the wide walk. The missionary not only saw him, but also Neste Bega, who was striding forward. Joe Lake was ahead of the trader. The Mormons followed with decision, and they all confronted Willits. He turned pale. Shad had cautiously moved along the rail, nearer to his gang, and then they, with the others of the curious crowd, drew closer. Willits, here's Shefford. Now say it to his face, declared the trader. He was angry and evidently wanted the fact known, as well as the situation. Willits had paled but he showed boldness. For an instant Shefford studied the smooth face with its sloping lines, the dark, wine-colored eyes. Willits, I understand you've maligned me to Bishop Kane and others, began Shefford curtly. I called you an atheist, returned the missionary harshly. Yes, and more than that. And I told these men why you vented your spite on me. Willits uttered a half-laugh, an uneasy, contemptuous expression of scorn and repudiation. "'The charges of such a man as you are can't hurt me,' he said. The man did not show fear so much as disgust at the meeting. He seemed to be absorbed in thought, yet no serious consideration of the situation made itself manifest. Shefford felt puzzled. Perhaps there was no fire to strike from this man. The desert had certainly not made him flint. He had not toiled, or suffered, or fought. "'But I can hurt you,' thundered Shefford, with startling suddenness. "'Here, look at this Indian. Do you know him? 
Glenn Nespa's brother. Look at him. Let us see you face him while I accuse you. You made love to Glenn Nespa, took her from her home. Harping infidel, replied Willits hoarsely. So that's your game. Well, Glenn Nespa came to my school of her own accord, and she will say so. Why will she? Because you blinded the simple Indian girl. Willits, I'll waste a little more time on you. And swift and light as a panther, Shefford leaped upon the man, and fastening powerful hands round the thick neck, bore him to his knees, and bent back his head over the rail. There was a convulsive struggle, a hard flinging of arms, a straining wrestle, and then Willits was in a dreadful position. Shefford held him in iron grasp. "'You damned white-livered hypocrite! I'm liable to kill you,' cried Shefford. I watched you and Glen Nespa that day up on the mountain. I saw you embrace her. I saw that she loved you. Tell that, you liar. That'll be enough. The face of the missionary turned purple as Shefford forced his head back over the rail. I'll kill you, man, repeated Shefford piercingly. Do you want to go to your god unprepared? Say you made love to Glen Nespa. Tell that you persuaded her to leave her home. Quick. Willits raised a shaking hand, and then Shefford relaxed the paralyzing grip and let his head come forward. The half-strangled man gasped out a few incoherent words that his livid, guilty face made unnecessary. Shefford gave him a shove, and he fell into the dust at the feet of the Navajo. "'Gentlemen, I leave him to Naste Bega," said Shefford, with a strange change from passion to calmness. Late that night, when the roistering visitors had gone, or were deep in drunken slumber, a melancholy and strange procession filed out of Stonebridge. Joe Lake and his armed comrades were escorting the Mormon women back to the hidden valley. They were mounted on burros and mustangs, and in all that dark and somber line there was only one figure which shone white under the pale moon. At the starting, until the white-clad figure had appeared, Shefford's heart had seemed to be in his throat, and thereafter its beat was muffled and painful in his breast. Yet there was some sweet sadness in the knowledge that he could see her now, be near her, watch over her. By and by the overcast clouds drifted, and the moon shone bright. The night was still. The great dark mountain loomed to the stars. The numberless waves of rounded rock that must be crossed and circled lay deep in shadow. There was only a steady pattering of light hoofs. Shefford's place was near the end of the line, and he kept well back, riding close to one woman and then another. No word was spoken. These sealed wives rode where their mounts were led or driven, as blind in their hoods as veiled Arab women in their palaquins and their heads drooped wearily and their shoulders bent, as if under a burden. It took an hour of steady riding to reach the ascent to the plateau, and here, with the beginning of rough and smooth and shadowed trail, the work of the escort began. The line lengthened out, and each man kept to the several women assigned to him. Shefford had three, and one of them was the girl he loved. She rode as if the world and time and life were naught to her. As soon as he dared trust his voice and his control, he meant to let her know the man, whom perhaps she had not forgotten, was there with her, a friend. Six months. It had been a lifetime to him, surely eternity to her. Had she forgotten? He felt like a coward who had basely deserted her. Oh, had he only known... She rode a burrow that was slow, continually blocking the passage for those behind, and eventually it became lame. Thus the other women forged ahead. Shefford dismounted and stopped her burrow. It was a moment before she noted the halt, and twice in that time Shefford tried to speak and failed. What poignant pain, regret, love, made his utterance fail? Ride my horse, he finally said, and his voice was not like his own. 
Obediently and wearily she dismounted from the burrow and got up on Nack Yaw. The stirrups were long for her, and he had to change them. His fingers were all thumbs as he fumbled with the buckles. Suddenly he became aware that there had been a subtle change in her. He knew it without looking up, and he seemed to be unable to go on with his task. If his life had depended upon keeping his head lowered, he could not have done it. The listlessness of her drooping form was no longer manifest. The peak of the dark hood pointed toward him. He knew then that she was gazing at him. Never so long as he lived would that moment be forgotten. They were alone. The others had gotten so far ahead that no sound came back. The stillness was so deep it could be felt. The moon shone with white, cold radiance, and the shining slopes of smooth stone waved away, crossed by shadows of pinions. Then she leaned a little toward him. One swift hand flew up to tear the black hood back so that she could see. In its place flashed her white face, and her eyes were like the night. You, she whispered. His blood came leaping to sting neck and cheek and temple. What dared he interpret from that single word? Could any other word have meant so much? No one else, he replied unsteadily. Her white hand flashed again to him, and he met it with his own. He felt himself standing cold and motionless in the moonlight. He saw her wonderful, with the deep shadowy eyes and a silver sheen on her hair and as he looked, she released her hand and lifted it, with the other, to her hood. He saw the shiny hair darken and disappear, and then the lovely face with its sad eyes and tragic lips. He drew Nakyaw's bridle forward and led him up the moonlit trail. End of Chapter 11, Part 2